that with us. So without further ado, let's bring up our first speaker, Dr. Scott Weingart, the man, the myth, the legend. Thank you. Just some housekeeping. If you have questions, you want to send it right to our Twitter moderator, so use at Paramedic Wiki. And if you hashtag at SmackUS, we will continue being the biggest trend in the United States, which I think maybe worldwide. Um, maybe Min could help with that. What we're going to talk about today is resequencing intubation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel like I'm being pranked. <laughs> oh my, okay, oh. all right, let's start off with the case. Yes, 43-year-old male, sat of 80% on non-rebreather, rolls up to the clavicles, severe respiratory distress, but the patient keeps ripping off the non-rebreather, trying to get out of bed, and shouting, he can't breathe. That's our case. And this case fits perfectly into a mantra that I've been preaching for the past, uh, I think, decade at this point, which is every time we pick up a laryngoscope, we are essentially being given a license to kill. And how we go about using it depends on how much we care about our patients. So this lecture is how to stop killing our patients in the peri-intubation. Now, my friend Bill Hinckley put forth our goals when intubating a patient, and he expressed it this way, dash 1A, and it was really a perfect compilation of the things we should be striving for. And what this means is, the first part of dash is definitive airway. You wanna get an endotracheal tube between the cords or somewhere in the trachea to know that we've now controlled this patient's airway. But we wanna do it without hypoxemia. And when, uh, when Bill this expressed this, it was sans hypoxemia, but you know, fuck the French, so I, I changed it to Latin, um, sine hypoxemia. And we've also added to this without hypotension. So those are the two things. You wanna do that definitive airway, but not have the patient get hypoxemic and not have the patient get hypotensive because both of those things lead to peri-intubation cardiac arrest. And then the 1A portion is on the first attempt. And why is this so important? Why can't we try a few times? I mean, they do it in the operating room all the time. It's okay. You can let the medical student take a few shots on that fasted patient. And if they don't get it, you just bag them back up. And, and now you actually will do the intubation. And that's fine in the operating room. It's not fine in our world. It's not fine in the ED. It's not fine in critical care. And it's not fine in the pre-hospital environment. And this has been proven. Folks like Thomas Mort, Folks like John Sackles have looked at this, and if you don't get that airway on the first attempt, the risk of morbidity and peri-intubation code increases dramatically. So you need to get that airway on the first attempt if you want to keep your patients safe. And then another concept to talk about is the concept of the crash airway. When I first started my career managing patients, it seemed like every airway was the crash airway. An airway where the patient needed to be intubated instantly, as soon as they presented. And as a result, we'd often uh, shirk getting things ready perfectly, positioning the patient perfectly, but we had no choice because they came in and they were hypoxemic or they were agitated or for whatever reason, we were just forced to immediately move to intubation. And as I developed a little savvy, if I have any, for airway, I realized very few intubations should be crash. And I'd almost go so far as to say, no intubations should be crash. That all the intubations that used to be, the patient who had acute pulmonary edema and a sky high blood pressure and their SAT was 74%, we used to crash intubate them. Now, we put them on non-invasive. And most of the time we don't have to intubate and if we do, we could do it at a safer point. The COPD or with low saturation, we don't crash intubate. The only crash intubation that some would argue still exists is the patient who is actually completely apneic or dead. And I would say even those patients these days should not be crash intubations because you probably should just do a crash supraglottic airway, temporize the situation, and then when you have everything prepared and ready to go, then intubate the patient. So there are no crash airways anymore and there's no excuse for bad airway preparation anymore. And this has been a paradigm shift. We've moved from low saturation being the indication for immediate intubation to, in my mind, 
never intubating until we've already achieved the highest saturation we possibly can before we make the move to actually pass the plastic. And this is all about taking control. It's all about feeling that we are masters of the patient's physiology because that's what's going to keep them safe. So we go back to this case of someone we want to pre but he's not letting it happen. He's fighting us, he's ripping off the mask. And he might be agitated due to septic uh, encephalopathy, or maybe it's hypercapnia, or maybe it's the hypoxemia itself. But for whatever reason, you're going to have patients who are not going to cooperate. So what do you do when they have a low saturation but they won't tolerate your preparations? Well, the classic answer, the board exam answer, would be to move to immediate rapid sequence intubation. And there's a lot of advocates even right now for this being what you should do. I just got a letter to the editor about an article I'm going to tell you about saying this, is, this thing I'm going to tell you about called DSI is crazy. What we should be doing is RSI and, and actually sticking with the standard paradigm. But in my mind, that's always been gambling. What you're gambling if you push your rapid sequence intubation meds on a patient like this is that you're going to be able to bring their saturation up during the apneic period because 80% is a really bad place to be. I don't like gambling. I like to know exactly what's going to happen to my patient minute by minute as I'm managing them when they're critically ill. But what they're talking about really isn't RSI because RSI would have you giving your induction med, giving your paralytic, and then leaving that apneic period without any positive pressure breaths. So what they're really talking about is a modified RSI. And this modified version of RSI, where you're actually bagging a patient during an apneic period, is somewhat dangerous. Now, I have no problem with people like my friend Rich, who give two or three gentle, perfect breaths during the apneic period. That's just a bonus. And that works out quite nicely. But that's not usually the way I see it happening. When you have a patient whose saturation is already 80%, you crash push your intubation meds, and then you start bagging them hoping it's going to come up. It's a little different in those circumstances. And there's a tendency to squeeze hard and fast, cause gastric insufflation. And then once the patient vomits, it all goes downhill. This patient at 80% sat is about a few seconds away from dropping down to 70. And 70% 70 is the critical desaturation point at which the risk of peri-intubation arrest becomes uh, really, really high. And then there's another issue, and I talk about it on the podcast, pulse ox lag. This patient at 80%, as you're bagging, will not, if he's sick, come up from that 80%, even if your breasts are going in. In the best of circumstances, the pulse ox represents where the patient's saturations were 30 seconds in the past. In critically ill patients with poor cardiac output, it could be up to two to three minutes. So even if they're doing a perfect set of uh, respirations with their BVM like Rich would, as that sat doesn't get any better, the natural inclination of our monkey brain is to bag harder and faster. And I promise you, in many of these circumstances, these patients are going to get gastric insufflation and be at risk of vomiting, or I should say passive uh, uh, regurgitation. So when I had seen enough of these patients, I'm sorry. Guys, let's play video number one. The one other thing is bagging a patient with physiologic shunt like this guy at 80 on a non-rebreather won't work anyway. This is George Kovacs video, you can see. That was a standard BVM, it didn't do anything to inflate that lung. Now look at this, with a PEEP valve on, yes, the lung will inflate. But I so rarely see people actually getting the PEEP valve. So what they're gonna advocate is bagging this patient at 80% on a non-rebreather up during the apneic period. There's no way that's gonna have any good effects on this patient's oxygen saturation. So to, to combat all of this, uh, I came up with a concept called delayed sequence intubation. It breaks the sequence of RSI, and it gives you an option, I think, to actually safely manage these patients who are not letting you do the things you want to do in the pre-intubation period. So delayed sequence intubation is a way of accomplishing all of these tasks that we should be doing for every single patient we intubate. Denitrogenation, preoxygenation, perfect positioning. If the patient needs it, they're a GI bleed, they're a small bowel obstruction, gastric emptying. And then perhaps most importantly, team briefing. And 
when it's a crash intubation, when you're forced to move, you don't get to do these things. But delayed sequence intubation now gives you an opportunity even in the agitated patient. So what is it? You have a patient who's delirious, who's fighting you, they're agitated, so you dissociate them. You give them a medication that will immediately calm them down, but will maintain airway reflexes, will maintain respiratory drive. And the prototypical agent for that is ketamine, my favorite medication in the world. And if you give ketamine at reasonably small doses in a sick patient, they will very rapidly dissociate. The doses we recommend, one milligram kilo per kilogram, which sounds low. People might be used to higher doses. Try the one milligram per kilogram and see the response. You will see the full results of ketamine within one circulatory time, within seconds. So there's no reason to give huge doses because there's dose-dependent side effects to this medication, like hypersalivation. So give a milligram per kilogram of the ketamine, wait a few seconds, the patient should fall back on the stretcher, eyes goggling back and forth, not fighting you at, any, at all anymore. If it doesn't, if that's not enough, give another 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Wait a few seconds, do it again if you need to. But eventually you'll get the patient to the point where they are dissociated. At this point you could pre-oxygenate, you could denitrogenate, you could put an NG tube in if you want. You could do all the things you want to do to get ready calmly and safely. And only at that point, after the patient's denitrogenated for three minutes, after their saturations have come up, push your paralytic agent, give apneic oxygenation during the apneic period, and then intubate them safely with a buffer of oxygen as a reservoir in their lungs. Delayed sequence intubation is not CPAP pre-oxygenation. You don't need to put the patient on non-invasive or give them PEEP in order to be doing DSI. In fact, many of the patients in the study I'm going to show you in a minute actually, uh, was, they were saturating okay, but they wouldn't tolerate the non-rebreather mask in order to wash out the nitrogen of their lungs. So DSI is not CPAP pre-oxygenation, but DSI works beautifully with CPAP pre-oxygenation for patients who are physiologically shunted and their saturations are not coming up with the standard pre-oxygenation techniques like a non-rebreather mask. These four concepts are the things I've been talking about for years now, and they all work very nicely together. And we've belabored apneic oxygenation at the point you don't need to hear about it anymore. We're talking about DSI and CPAP pre-oxygenation right now. And using a ventilator as a better bag may be a topic for a future smack talk. So let's say on this patient, they're showing us that a non-rebreather is not enough to get their saturations up. How should we apply CPAP for pre-oxygenation? In the old days, I would have said, just get a ventilator, have respiratory, keep ventilators in your resuscitation bay so that you could just immediately turn it on and put the patient on PEEP through the ventilator. But having actually road tested that with a host of people at many, many different institutions across the world, I realized that probably is not the safest way to go. It works beautifully, but it adds a level of technical expertise and, and possible error that's probably not worth it. I don't recommend that anymore. These CPAP devices, great, but you might not have them, you might not know how to use them. Don't do it. Grab a nasal cannula. If you're somewhere in the UK, you could grab a Mapleson circuit. I make my own, and all I say is get a PEEP valve. If you don't know what these are, your respiratory therapy department or your hospital stocks these. Every hospital in the world has these. They're dirt cheap, and they fit on the exhalation port of every BVM out there, and they allow you to dial in whatever PEEP you want. If you put a nasal cannula underneath the mask of that BVM with a PEEP valve, it becomes a high-flow CPAP device that will allow the patient to have whatever PEEP you dial in regardless of whether they're breathing or not. So on a patient you're doing DSI on, put on a nasal cannula, grab a BVM, put a PEEP valve on it, and put that over the patient's face with a two-hand mask seal. And that's gonna force you to do two things. One, it's gonna force you to realize very quickly whether or not the patient needs PEEP, because you'll hold that mask on and a PEEP is zero, look up, SAT's not coming up, dial it to five, dial it to 10, dial it to 15. It'll also force you to be watching the patient the whole time you're doing delayed sequence intubation because you're standing there right over them with two hands on their mask. And you don't have to squeeze this bag. They're spontaneous respirations along with that nasal cannula and will do all the work for you. And so now all of a sudden the patient's getting 100% FiO2. They're getting whatever PEEP you dial in. They already have the nasal cannula on for their apneic oxygenation, and you're now watching them like a hawk because you're holding that mask over their face. This is how I recommend CPAP pre-oxygenation, and this is how I recommend DSI pre-oxygenation. 
So nasal cannula, BVM, peep valve. Put the nasal cannula at 15. The BVM has a peep valve. It could go anywhere up to 15 centimeters of water. And the BVM is on 15 liters of oxygen. So it's the rule of 15s coined by my friend Anton Hellman, and that's all you have to remember. Nasal cannula 15, BVM 15, both liters per minute, and a peep valve up to 15 centimeters of water. And this is the ideal pre-oxygenation device. Now, sometimes we use DSI even though the patient tolerates denitrogenation and their SATs are fine. And if you have a patient, cirrhotic, upper GI bleed, belly out to here, that's pretty risky to intubate that patient with a belly full of blood. And it, it works out very poorly once that uh, lower esophageal sphincter starts opening up. It's an endless flood. And Jim might have some answers on what to do if you've already missed the boat and they're doing that. But it would be a lot nicer if you would just get an NG tube in and suck out the two liters of blood initially. And some of our patients who we use DSI on are actually simply because they won't tolerate me placing that NG tube. And so we give the ketamine, we place the NG tube, they get an insane amount of analgesia from that ketamine, and then we can pre oxygenate them at the same time we're sucking out all that blood. All right, where's the evidence for delayed sequence intubation? I wrote a paper, some of the authors are with me here. I don't know if Soren's here, I see Seth Truger here in the audience. Um, but we actually looked at our patients who we were uh, gonna do DSI on, and we looked at this prospectively. 62 patients, all the reasons you'd expect for ED intubations, all the standard stuff. And uh, the, the actual number of patients who were intubated um, for oxygenation was the vast majority. Some of them had ventilatory failure, and some of them had mental status changes, uh, possible head injury. We just wanted to intubate them for airway protection. And uh, a good portion of the patients were physiologically shunted. They actually couldn't get their saturations up with a non-rebreather, so they wouldn't tolerate non-invasive, so we gave the ketamine in order to allow them to take non-invasive ventilation. And here's the graph they had me put in the article. We can't interpret this. This is only for stat nerds. Uh, this is a lot easier to see. On the left side of the screen is the patient's initial saturations. And then on the right side of the screen is what happened after we gave the ketamine and pre-oxygenated the patient. And on the left, all those patients were with maximal attempts at trying to convince them to pre-oxygenate. And uh, almost every patient increased their SAT. Uh, two patients dropped by 1% to 2% on their SATs. Uh, and this is not really the graph that I'm proud of. Uh, the one that really matters to me is this one. This subsetted out the patients whose initial saturation, despite maximal attempts, was less than 93%. These are the patients Dan Davis in San Diego would tell you are at risk for critical desaturation during the intubation. These are the guys that try to die if you just move right to RSI. And every single patient in this cohort increased their saturations with DSI, and all but two of them increased to above that 93% threshold. Now, this was listed as just a prospective cohort trial, uh, and we didn't want to belabor this because it makes the people at the journals a little bit uh, leery, but this was actually a self-controlled trial when you think about it, because every single one of these patients was their own control. We gave them our best shot at pre oxygenating by standard means, and then those same patients got DSI and then became their own control to see what would happen after we were able to pre oxygenate them after the ketamine. There were no complications. Two patients actually avoided intubation entirely. And that's one of the dirty little secrets of DSI, is you take that asthmatic, they look like crap, they're at the end of their spectrum for muscle fatigue, and they're hypercapnic, so that acidosis is not helping their muscles at all. And they're not even taking in that bronchodilator you're sticking on their face anymore. But they won't tolerate non-invasive to help push it in. You give them ketamine and put them on non-invasive and they settle down, their saturations come up entirely, their wheezing gets better, and you say to yourself, do I really need to intubate this patient? And the answer probably is no. You probably could watch them, let them wake up, and then see how they are at that point. And if they still need intubation, you could absolutely do it. But I don't advocate this because this is a departure. So I would tell you, every patient you do DSI on, you should intubate. If you give the ketamine, you should intubate them. But if you don't, it might work, but if it doesn't, you can't blame me, because I told you not to. All right, you want more evidence? Ruben Strayer, who you've heard talk at this conference, did a systematic review of adult, not pediatrics, because I know nothing about kids, and for some reason they get more problems with ketamine, but adult ketamine procedural sedations, and the complication rate is insanely low, 
And the complications that are there are things I do not care about for DSI, like emergence phenomenon. Not really an issue when you're using this as a bridge to intubating a patient. Um, but the real serious complications do not happen. What if something did go wrong? What if you were the first reportable case of adult ketamine-induced apnea. And if you push ketamine quickly, all patients will get apneic, and it'll last 10 seconds and they all start breathing again. I'm talking about prolonged apnea. What if you were that one case? It's totally fine, because you would never do DSI without being totally set to intubate this patient. And if you were that one in a million case of apnea that was prolonged from ketamine, then just convert to RSI. If your patient stops breathing, then <laughs> if your patient stops breathing, then just push your paralytic at that point and you were exactly where you would have been if you had just done RSI in the first place. So DSI becomes RSI. This, the slides are doing an auto advancing thing again. Um, so, and I, oh no. Oh no, this is really. <laughs> no, I, I, um, wow, it's like a war. Now I say that, and it. <laughs> All right, guys, just turn off the slides for me. Um, I, I'm not doing it anymore. No more slides. Okay, so I just told you that uh, if they do you know, become apneic, then you should just move to RSI because of course you've prepared everything you need in order to be able to take care of it. But another dirty little secret. Sometimes when the patient's really agitated and we need to take immediate control, we just push the ketamine. And at the same time we're pushing it, we're getting ready to intubate that. And we do that with the absolute knowledge that in adult ketamine sedation, nothing is going to go wrong. That we've done this thousands of times for non-intubation techniques, and these patients don't stop breathing, they don't lose their airway reflexes, they keep on going, and is, you definitely want someone there the second you push that ketamine watching them like a hawk, but I will sometimes take control of the situation, push the ketamine to get an agitated patient who's flailing about controlled while my team is actually preparing the rest of the stuff for intubation. But if you ask me, I'm going to tell you, have everything ready to go before that point. That way, if it, you screw up, it's all on you. All right, let's see if we can. Okay, emesis. Everyone's worried about emesis with ketamine. Uh, it's all from post-emergence. They don't start vomiting in the peri-procedural period of ketamine, at least in adults, so that's not a worry. If you decide to wake your patient up, I would advocate you start watching them very strongly and uh, right around the 15-minute mark because uh, they actually might start waking up and look a little nauseous, especially if you have them on a non-invasive mask. I empirically give Zofran. I have no idea if that works, but the real answer is if you start DSI, you should just intubate them. Altered mental status. Can you give patients non-invasive while well, altered mental status? The disassociation of ketamine is very, very different. And you absolutely can because you're there watching them like a hawk. You're there at their airway actually making sure everything's fine. Can you do this with other meds besides ketamine? Standard intubation meds? No. You don't know what dose is the critically ill patient's going to need. Uh, and you don't know which dose is going to induce apnea. It's not the same as when you're reducing a shoulder. That these doses change, the pharmacodynamics change in critically ill patients. Don't use Atomidate, don't use Propofol. We were hoping dexmedetomidine would be the answer. It takes too long, don't use that. A drug that works fantastically that I don't have anymore is Dropiridol. If you decide to use this and it works wonderfully, I've played with it, uh, you need to give a real induction med right at the point you give your paralytic because Dropiridol chills them out but they still have some degree of awareness. So DSI is just procedural sedation, and the procedure is pre-oxygenation. If you want to hear more about any of this, you can go to mcrit.org slash preox and slash DSI, and I have all the articles and all the evidence there. So to bring it all home, every time you pick up a laryngoscope, you're being given a license to kill. What you do with it depends on how much you care about your patients. 
don't be forced into a crash intubation. Crash intubation should not happen anymore. We have the techniques to temporize any situation to give us the time to prepare for the intubation properly. DSI keeps you in control. This is the most vulnerable moment in the patient's hospital course. Their lives are in your hands. Please, please do not let the laryngoscope be a murder weapon. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, many of you may not know that it takes a lot of guts to uh, advance the wheel of medicine forward. And when Scott first put out this delayed sequence, Annals of Emergency Medicine thought, eh, not so much. And they actually rejected his paper. And it took me a lot of convincing him to go back to Annals and say, you know. And, uh, but I, I think it really is remarkable that it takes a lot of guts to push the wheel forward. And, and Scott, you've done that in a major way on multiple levels. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Um, Dr. Andy Slos, uh, we're, are we going to do the Twitter moderation first, or are we going to do the Twitter moderation? Usually again? it's uh, speaker by speaker, but I think I took uh, a lot of my lot of time. Do we have time for one question, Rich? Uh, Hayden Drake. Yeah. On the Twitter. Very, very busy. You uh, generate a lot of discussion amongst the people here. Got lots of conversations going on. Uh, Min asks what the role of RSA, rapid sequence EOA, in the critically hypoxic patient. Did yeah. you say Min? Man. Who's that guy? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, that guy. Uh, so know. for folks that don't know, RSA is rapid sequence airway, a term first uh, coined by our friend uh, Darren Brody. And the idea is you push your induction meds and your paralytic and then immediately place a supraglottic airway to allow you to bag the patient more safely. Um, I use RSA for patients who have uh, critical metabolic acidosis and uh, they are compensating with respiratory drive, but their mental status is dropping. And... I want to continue bagging them during the apneic period, and the safest way to do that is probably through a supraglottic airway. Uh, I would not do it for this patient who's agitated because I have another technique, but if you are forced to bag a patient during the apneic period, RSA is probably one of the safest ways to do it. Okay, well that's a great segue 